The Chronicle of Peru by Pedro Cieza de Leon, a Spanish conquistador and chronicler who lived from 1520 to 1554. Translated to English by Clements R. Marca for the Hacklet Society of London in England. Chapter 31. Concerning the river of Santa Martha, and of the things which are met with on its banks. Now that I have reached the city of Papayan, and described its site, neighborhood, founding, and people, it seems well that I should give an account of the river which flows near it, and which is one of the two branches which form the great river of Santa Martha. Before treating of this river, however, I will relate what I find in the scriptures concerning the four principal rivers mentioned there, which are, first, the Ganges, flowing through the East Indies, second, the Nile, separating Asia from Africa, and watering the land of Egypt, third and fourth, the Tigris and Euphrates, which encircle the two regions of Mesopotamia and Cappadocia. These are the four which are said, in the Holy Scriptures, to issue out of the earthly paradise. I also find that mention is made of three others, which are the river Indus, whence India takes its name, the river Danube, being the principal in Europe, and the river Tanais, dividing Europe from Asia. Of all these, the greatest is the Ganges, concerning which Ptolemy says, in his book of geography, that the narrowest part is 8,000 paces, and the broadest 20,000 paces across. According to this, the broadest part of the Ganges is seven leagues across. This is the extreme breadth of the largest river in the world, that was known before the discovery of these Indies. But now they have found rivers of such strange bigness, that they appear more like gulfs of the sea, than rivers which flow through the land. This appears from what is stated by many of the Spaniards who went with the Adelantado Oriana. They declare that the river which flows from Peru into the North Sea, commonly called the Amazons or Marignon, is more than a thousand leagues long, and in some parts twenty-five broad, and the Rio de la Plata is said by many who have been there to be so broad that, in many places, the banks on either side are not visible from the center of the stream, being more than eight leagues across. The river of Darien, too, is great, and that of Eurepa is no smaller, and there are many others of great size in these Indies, amongst which is this river of Santa Martha. The river of Santa Martha is formed by two branches. One of these, which flows by the city of Papayan, rises in the great cordillera of the Andes, in some valleys formed by the mountains five or six leagues from the city. These valleys were well peopled in former times, and are so to this day, though not so thickly, by certain Indians whom they call Coconucos, and among these, near a village called Cotera, this river has its source, which, as I have before said, is one of the branches of the great and rich river of Santa Martha. The sources of the two branches are forty leagues from each other, and the river is so large at the place where they unite, that it has a breadth of one league, while, where it enters into the North Sea, near the city of Santa Martha, it is seven leagues broad, and its force is so great that its waters enter into the waves at last to be converted into part of the sea. Many ships have taken in good fresh water from it out at sea, for its force is so mighty that it passes for more than four leagues into the sea before it mingles with the salt water. It enters the sea by many mouths and openings. In the mountain of the Coconucos, which I have already said is the birthplace of one of the branches, it is like a little brook, but it flows on to the broad valley of Cali, receiving streams from mountains on both sides, so that, when it reaches the city of Cali, it is so great and powerful that to me it seemed to have as much water as the Guadalquivir at Seville. Lower down, when it reaches Buritica, near the city of Antioquia, having received many more streams, it is still larger. There are provinces and villages of Indians from the source of this river to the point where it enters the ocean, and such wealth of gold, both in mines and in the possession of the Indians, that it cannot be exaggerated, it being so great. The natives of these regions are not very intelligent, and they have so many languages that, in going amongst them, it was necessary to take many interpreters. All the wealth of the province of Santa Martha, most of that of Carthagena, of Nueva Granada, and of the province of Papayan, is near this river, and, besides the country which has been discovered near its banks, there are rumors of populous districts between the two branches, which have yet to be explored. The Indians say that in these districts there is great store of riches, and that the Indians who are natives possess the mortal herb of Yoruba. The Adelantado Don Pedro de Aradia passed by the bridge of Brenuco, where, the river flowing in great strength, the Indians had made a bridge with trees and strong creepers, after the fashion of the bridges I have described already. He went some days march by land, but returned, having few horses and Spaniards with him. The Adelantado Don Sebastian de Balalcazar also wished to send another captain by a route more to the eastward, which is less dangerous, called the Valley of Abura, to explore the country thoroughly between the two branches of this great river. But when he was on the road the enterprise was abandoned, in order to send the troops to the Viceroy Blasco Nunez Vela, at the time when he was at war with Gonzalo Pizarro and his followers. Returning to the subject of this river of Santa Martha, 
I would observe that, where the two branches unite, a number of islands are formed, some of which are inhabited. Near the sea there are many very fierce alligators and other great fish, called manatee, which are as large as a calf, and are born on the beaches and islands. They come out to browse when they can do so without danger, and presently return to their haunts. About 120 leagues below the city of Antiochia, that of Mompox has been founded, within the jurisdiction of Carthagena, and here they call this river the Cauca. The length of the river from its source to the sea is more than 400 leagues. Chapter 32. In which the account of the villages and chiefs subject to the city of Papayan is concluded, and what there is to be said until the boundary of Papayan is passed. This city of Papayan has many large villages within the boundaries of its jurisdiction. Towards the east it has the populous province of Gambia, and others called Ganza, Maluasa, Palindra, Palace, Tembio, and Kalaza, all thickly peopled. The Indians of these districts have much gold of seven quilates, more or less. They also have some fine gold, of which they make ornaments, but the quantity is small in proportion to the baser kind. They are warlike, and as great butchers as those of the provinces of Arma, Pozo, and Antiochia. But as these nations have no knowledge of our true God Jesus Christ, it seems that little account should be taken of their life and customs. Not that they fail to understand all that pleases them and is good in their eyes, living cunningly, and compassing the death of each other in their wars. And they also had great wars with the Spaniards, without caring to keep the peace which they had promised, until at last they were conquered. Before they would yield, they preferred to die rather than be subjected, such was their hardihood, and they believed that the want of provisions would force the Spaniards to leave the country. In truth the Spaniards suffered much misery from famine, before they could fully establish their new settlement. The natives were the cause of the loss of thousands of lives, eating each other's bodies, and sending their souls to hell. At first some care was taken for the conversion of these Indians, but they were not supplied with complete knowledge of our holy religion, owing to the want of priests. At present things are in better order, both as to their treatment and conversion, for His Majesty, with great zeal for Christianity, has ordered that they shall be preached to. And the lords of the High Council of the Indies take great care that this order is complied with, and have sent out learned friars of holy life and manners, so that, by the favour of God, great fruit will be derived from their labours. Towards the snowy mountains or Cordillera of the Andes, there are many valleys thickly inhabited by Indians called Coconucos, in whose country the great river takes its rise. Their customs are the same as those of the Indians we have left behind, except that they do not commit the abominable sin of eating human flesh. There are many volcanoes, or fiery mouths, in the lofty parts of the mountains, and out of one comes hot water, from which they make salt. Their art in making salt is a thing well worthy of note, and I promise to give an account of it further on, after I have finished what I have to say concerning the town of Pasto. Near these Indians there is a village called Zodora, and further on another called Guanaca. To the eastward is the extensive province of the Pax, who have worked so much evil to the Spaniards. It contains seven or eight thousand Indians fit for war, who are valiant and dexterous in fighting, with fine bodies, and very clean. They have their captains whom they obey, and live in valleys surrounded by very rugged mountains through which many rivers and streams flow, and in which it is believed there are good mines. In fighting, they use stout lances of black palm wood, twenty-five palmos long, besides huge stones, which they throw or roll down when occasion serves. They have killed so many valiant Spaniards, as well captains as soldiers, that it causes sorrow and fear to behold what injury these Indians have done, being so few. But there were grave faults on the part of those who were killed, in that they held these people so cheap, and God permitted that the Spaniards should fall, and the Indians be victorious. So things went on until the Adelantado Don Sebastian de Balalcazar destroyed their crops, and forced them to make peace. Towards the east is the province of Guachico, and further on are many other provinces. To the south is the village of Cachesquio, and the small lagoon, also the district they call Las Barrancas, where there is a small village of the same name. Further on are other villages, the river called Las Juntas, another called Las Capitanas, the great province of Masteles, and the district of Pesha, which includes a beautiful valley watered by a river that is fed by streams flowing from the other district. This river carries its waters into the South Sea. All these plains and valleys were once thickly peopled, but the natives who have survived the wars have retired into the heights and fastnesses which overhang them. Towards the west is the province of Bomba and other villages, whose inhabitants trade with each other, besides other districts peopled by many Indians, where a town has been founded, and they call them the provinces of Chapanchita. All these villages are situated in fertile land, and they have a great quantity of gold. In some parts idols have been seen, but there is no report of any temple or house of worship having been met with. They converse with the devil, and, by his advice, they do many things in accordance with his wishes. 
they have no knowledge of the immortality of the soul, but they think that their chiefs will return to life, and some believe, as I have been informed, that the souls of the dead enter into the bodies of the newly born. They perform ceremonies at the burial of their dead, and place them in large and deep tombs. With their chiefs they inter some women and all their property, besides food and wines. In some parts they burn the bodies until they are converted to ashes, and in others they merely preserve the dried bodies. In these provinces there are the same fruits and provisions as in those we have left behind, except that there are no pixie bee palms, but they gather great quantities of potatoes. The people go naked and barefoot without more clothes than a small mantle and a few ornaments of gold. The women go covered with small mantles of cotton, and wear necklaces of small flies made of pure gold, which are very pretty and becoming. As to their customs in the matter of marriage, I will not relate anything about them because they are childish, and I also pass over other matters as being of no importance. Some of the Indians are great magicians and sorcerers. We here learnt, also, that there are many herbs, both wholesome and harmful, in these parts. All the Indians eat human flesh. The province round Papayan was one of the most populous in all Peru, and if it had been subjected by the Incas it would have been the best and richest of all. Chapter 33. In which an account is given of what there is between Papayan and the city of Pasto, who was the founder of Pasto, and what there is to be said concerning the natives of the neighboring districts. The city of Papayan is forty leagues from the town of Pasto, and the first village on the road was great and very populous in ancient times, as well as when the Spaniards discovered it, and even now it contains many Indians. The valley of Pesha becomes very narrow at this village, and the Indians live in deep and lofty ravines on the western side. The Spaniards call the place El Pueblo de la Sal. It is very rich, and has yielded goodly tribute of fine gold to those who have held the encomienda here. The natives, in their arms, dress, and customs, resemble those of the countries we have already passed, except that they do not eat human flesh, and are a little more civilized. They have many very fragrant pineapples, and they trade with the province of Chapanchita and with other neighboring districts. Beyond this village is the province of Masteles, which contains, or did contain, more than 4,000 Indians fit for war. Adjoining it is the province of the Abadis and the villages of Isankal and Pangan and Kakwampas, and that they call Los Choros, and Piquilinbai, also Tiles and Angayan, Pagual, Chuchaldo, and many more. Inland, towards the west, there are reports of many more Indian villages and rich mines in districts extending as far as the South Sea. The following villages also border on the road, namely, Asquil, Malama, Tukurs, Saais, Isles, Guamatal, Funes, Chapel, Males, and Piales, Pupales, Turca, and Kumba. All these villages were inhabited by chiefs and Indians called Pastos, and hence the town of Pasto has received its name, being as much as to say, the town built in the land of Pasto. Also another tribe of Indians borders on the Indians called Pastos, who are known as the Quilasingas, and whose villages are to the eastward, and are well peopled. The names of their principal villages are Mocondino, Bexandino, Bizaco, Guajanzangua, Mocaxanduk, Quaquanker, and Macaxamata. Still further to the east there is another province, which is somewhat larger and more fertile, called Pastico, and another near a lake on the summit of a mountain, where the water is so cold that, though the lake is eight leagues long and more than four broad, no fish nor bird can live in it. The land, too, produces no maize, nor are there any trees. There is another lake near it of the same kind. Further on there are great mountains, and the Spaniards do not know what there is on the other side of them. There are other villages on the road to this city, but it seems unnecessary to enumerate them, having already mentioned the principal ones. With regard to this city of Pasto, I have to say that no city or town in the whole government of Papayan has so many Indians subject to it, and it even has more than Quito and other places in Peru. Populous as the district now is, in ancient times it must have been far more populous, for it is most astonishing to see, in all the widespread plains, on the banks of rivers, on the hills and lofty mountains, that there is not a part, how rugged and inaccessible soever, which does not give signs of having been tilled or built over in times past. The customs of these Indians, called Quilasingas and Pastos, differ from those of the people we have passed, for the Pastos do not eat human flesh, either when they fight with the Spaniards or with each other. Their arms are stones thrown from the hand, staves like shepherds' crooks, and a few badly made lances. They are a poor-spirited people. The chiefs are well-mannered, but the rest of the Indians are ill-favored, as well the men as the women, and all very dirty, but gentle and good-tempered. All these Indians are so nasty, that, when they louse themselves, they eat the lice as if they had been nuts, and their drinking vessels and cooking utensils are very seldom cleaned out. They have no creed, nor have idols been seen amongst them, but they believe that after death they will come to life again to live in some pleasant and delightful place.
There are some things amongst these Indians that are so secret that God alone can penetrate them. Their women go dressed in a narrow cloth which covers them from the bosom to the knees, with a smaller one falling over it. These mantles are made either of the bark of a tree or of cotton. The men wear a mantle three or four varas long, which is passed once round the waist, and then over the neck, the end being wrapped round the head. The quillasingas, as well as the pastos, also wear a cloth between the legs. They wear a mantle of cotton, which is broad and flowing, with another over the shoulders, the women wearing one which falls over the bosom. The quillasingas converse with the devil. They have neither temple nor creed, and when they die the bodies are put into large and deep tombs, together with all the property of the deceased, which is not much. If the dead man has been a chief, they bury some of his wives and servants with him. They also have a custom, which is this, according to what I am told, when one of the chiefs dies, the surrounding chiefs send two or three of their women, who are taken to the tomb and given enough maize wine to make them drunk. As soon as they are insensible they are buried in the tomb to keep company with the dead man, so that none of these savages die without having twenty persons to keep them company, and, besides these people, they put many jars of wine and other provisions into the tomb. When I passed through the country of these Indians, I collected the particulars which I now relate with great diligence, making all the inquiries I possibly could, and, among other things, I asked why they practiced such an evil custom, and why, not content with burying their own women alive, they sought for more victims from amongst their neighbors. I found out that the devil appears in a terrible and appalling form, according to their own account, and gives them to understand that they will come to life again in a great kingdom which is prepared for them, and that they will arrive with more authority if they are well attended. They also fall into other sins through the wiles of this accursed enemy. God our Lord knows why He allows the devil to converse with these people, and to wield such great power over them by deceiving them. Now His Divine Majesty is displayed, and many Indians, abhorring the devil, have embraced our holy religion. Some of the pastos converse with the devil. When the chiefs die, all possible honor is done to their memory, the people mourn for many days, and the same things are put into their tombs as I have already stated. The districts of Pasto yield but little maize, but there are great breeding places for cattle, and especially for pigs, which are raised in vast quantities. The country yields much barley, potatoes, and schemas, and there are very luscious granadillas and other fruits. In the country of the Quilisingas there is plenty of maize and much fruit, except in the neighborhood of the lake, where the people have neither trees nor maize, the land being so cold. These Quilisingas are warlike and untamable. There are great rivers of very remarkable water in their country, and it is believed that some of them contain abundance of gold. One of these rivers flows between Papayan and Pasto, called the Hot River, which is dangerous and difficult to cross in the winter time. They have stout ropes stretched from one bank to the other, for crossing it. This river contains the most excellent water I have met with in the Indies, or even in Spain. Beyond this river, on the road to Pasto, there is a mountain, of which the ascent is three good leagues long. The famous chase which Gonzalo Pizarro and his followers gave the Viceroy Blasco Núñez Vela, extended as far as this river. Chapter 34. In which the account of what there is in this country is concluded, as far as the boundary of Pasto. There is another rather large river in this country of the Pastos, called Ancasmayu, which is the point to which the King Winnicapac, son of the great Captain Tupac Yunkiyupanqui, extended his conquests. Having passed the hot river, and the mountain beyond it, the road continues over some plains and hills, and crosses a small paramo, where there was no little cold when I travelled over it. Further on there is a high mountain, on the summit of which a volcano sends forth quantities of smoke at intervals, and in times past, the natives say, it threw out volleys of stones. Coming from Papayan, this volcano is left on the right-hand side. The town of Pasto is situated in a very beautiful valley, through which a river of very sweet and wholesome water flows, fed by numerous springs and brooks. This valley is called Atris, and was formerly very populous, but the inhabitants have now retired to the mountains. It is surrounded by mountains, some wooded and others bare, and the Spaniards have their farms and hunting lodges in the valley. The banks of the river are always sown with much excellent wheat, barley, and maize, and there is a mill where the wheat is ground, for in this town they do not eat maize bread, owing to the abundance of wheat. In the plains there are quantities of deer, rabbits, partridges, doves, pigeons, pheasants, and turkeys, and the Indians take many in the chase. The land of the Pastos is excessively cold, and in summer it is colder than in winter, the same thing occurring in the town of the Christians, insomuch that the company of a wife is by no means irksome to a husband, nor is plenty of clothes disagreeable. The delightful town of Pasto was founded and settled by the Captain Don Lorenzo de Aldana, in the name of His Majesty, the Adelantado Don Francisco Pizarro being his governor and captain general of all the provinces of Peru, in the year of our Lord 1539. 
the said Lorenzo Daldana was lieutenant general for the same Don Francisco Pizarro in Quito, Pasto, Popayan, Tamana, Cali, Anzerma, and Cartago. He governed them all, either himself or through lieutenants whom he named, and, as is said by many conquerors in these parts, he ordered that the natives should be well treated during the whole time that he was in command. Chapter 35. Of the notable fountains and rivers in these provinces, and how they make salt of good quality by a very curious artifice. Before I treat of the kingdom of Peru, or leave the government of Papayan, it seems to me well to give some account of the notable fountains there are in this land, and of the rivers of water from which they make salt, for thus the people are sustained, having no salt pits in these parts, and the sea being far distant. When the licentiate Juan de Vidio set out from Carthagena, we marched over the mountains of Abibe, which are very rugged and difficult to cross, so that we passed a time of no little hardship, most of the horses died, and we were obliged to leave the greater part of our baggage in the road, and, having reached the plain, we found many villages, with great store of fruit trees, and broad rivers. But, as the stock of salt which we had brought with us from Carthagena was coming to an end, our food being herbs and beans for want of meat, except that of horses and a few dogs we caught, we began to feel distress, and many, from the want of salt, began to lose their color, and became yellow and thin. We procured some things in the Indian farms, but there was only a little black salt mixed with the ahi that the natives eat, and even this was very scarce, so that he thought himself fortunate who could get any. Necessity teaches men notable things, and we found a lake in a small mountain, the water of which was black and salt. We put a quantity of this water into jars, which gave us a relish for our food. The natives of these provinces take the quantity of water they require either from this lake or from others of the same kind, and boil it in great jars. As soon as the fire has consumed the greater part of the water, black salt remains at the bottom, with which, though not of good taste, they season their food, and live without feeling the want that would let itself be known if it were not for these fountains. Divine Providence takes such care of his creatures that, in all parts, he gives them what they require, and if men would always consider the ways of nature, they would know the obligation they are under to serve our true God. In the province called Cori, which is near the town of Anzerma, there is a river which flows with considerable force, and near it there are some ponds of salt water, whence the Indians obtain the quantity they require, and, making great fires, they place jars of this salt water on them, and set the water to boil until from an aroba there is not left half an otsumber. Then their experience enables them to convert the residue into as pure and excellent salt as is made from the salt pits of Spain. Throughout the districts of Antioquia there are many of these fountains, and they make so much salt that they take it inland, and exchange it for gold, cotton cloth, and other things which they may require. Beyond the great river which flows near the city of Cali, and near that of Papayan, towards the north, we discovered a village called Munja, in company with the captain Jorge Robledo, whence we crossed the Cordillera of the Andes, and discovered the valley of Abura and its plains. In this village of Munja, and in another called Sunusara, we found some other fountains in mountains near a river, and from these fountains the natives made so much salt that their houses were full of it, molded into shapes exactly like loaves of sugar. They took this salt by the valley of Abura to the provinces to the eastward, which have not been discovered or seen by the Spaniards to this day. This salt has made the Indians exceedingly rich. In the province of Caramanta, which is not very distant from the town of Anzerma, there is a fountain which rises out of a river of sweet water, and turns some of its water into a vapor resembling smoke, which assuredly must arise from there being some metal in that part. The Indians make good black salt from this water, and they also say that they know of a lake near a great rock, at the foot of which there is the same kind of water. They make salt from this water for their chiefs, for they say that it makes better and whiter salt than in any other part. In the province of Anzerma, and in all its districts, there are fountains of the same sort, from which they make salt. In the provinces of Arma, Carapa, and Picara, they suffer much from the want of salt, there being many inhabitants and few of these fountains, so that the salt that is brought fetches a high price. In the city of Cartago every citizen has his apparatus for making salt, which is prepared in an Indian village called Consoda, a league from the city, where a small river flows. Near the river there is a mountain, out of which comes a large spring of very black and thick water. The water is taken from this spring and boiled in cauldrons until it is nearly all evaporated, when a white grain salt remains, as good as that of Spain. The citizens of that city use no other salt than that which is obtained from this spring. Further on there is another village called Coyusa, near which flows several rivers of very remarkable water. I noticed in them a thing which astonished me not a little. This was that certain brackish pools were formed by these streams, and also at the source whence they take their rise, and that the Indians, with much industry, had certain pipes, made of the stout canes of these parts, fixed in them after the manner of ships' pumps, so that they could pump up the quantity of water they required, 
and make their salt from it. In the city of Cali there are none of these springs, and the Indians get their salt by barter from a province near the sea, called Timbas. Those who cannot make the exchange boil fresh water, and mix a certain herb with it, by which they make a bad salt a very evil smell. The Spaniards who live in this city do not feel the want of salt because the port of Buenaventura is near, and vessels arrive there from Peru with large blocks of salt. In the city of Papayan there are some of these fountains, especially among the Coconucos, but not so many, nor of such good quality as those of Anzerma and Cartago. At Pasto all the salt is obtained by trading, and it is better than that of Papayan. I have seen many springs, besides those which I have now described, with my own eyes, but it seems to me that I have said enough to make the reader understand the manner of procuring salt from these springs. Having declared the method of making salt in these provinces, I shall now pass on to the great kingdom of Peru. Chapter 36. Which contains the description and appearance of the kingdom of Peru from the city of Quito to the town of La Plata, a distance of more than 700 leagues. Now that I have finished what there is to be told respecting the province of Papayan, it appears to me that it is time to use my pen in giving an account of the notable things that are to be said of Peru, commencing from the city of Quito. But, before describing that city, it will be convenient to give a sketch of the whole country, which is 700 leagues long and 100 in breadth, rather more in some parts and less in others. I do not at present desire to treat of the whole empire over which the king's Yincas ruled, which was more than 1,200 leagues long, but I shall confine myself to that part which is understood under the name of Peru, from Quito to La Plata. In this land of Peru there are three desert ranges where men can in no wise exist. One of these comprises the Montaña, forests, of the Andes, full of dense wildernesses, where men cannot, nor ever have lived. The second is the mountainous region, extending the whole length of the Cordillera of the Andes, which is intensely cold, and its summits are covered with eternal snow, so that, in no way, can people live in this region, owing to the snow and the cold, and also because there are no provisions, all things being destroyed by the snow and by the wind, which never ceases to blow. The third range comprises the sandy deserts from Tumbay to the other side of Tarapaca, in which there is nothing to be seen but sandhills and the fierce sun which dries them up, without water, nor herb, nor tree, nor created thing, except birds, which, by the gift of their wings, wander wherever they list. This kingdom, being so vast, has great deserts, for the reasons I have now given. The inhabited region is after this fashion. In parts of the mountains of the Andes there are ravines and dales, which open out into deep valleys of such width as often to form great plains between the mountains, and, although the snow falls, it all remains on the higher part. As these valleys are closed in, they are not molested by the winds, nor does the snow reach them, and the land is so fruitful that all things which are sown yield abundantly, and there are trees and many birds and animals. The land being so fertile, is well peopled by the natives. They make their villages with rows of stones roofed with straw, and live healthily and in comfort. Thus the mountains of the Andes form these dales and ravines, in which there are populous villages, and rivers of excellent water flow near them. Some of these rivers send their waters to the South Sea, entering by the sandy deserts which I have mentioned, and the humidity of their water gives rise to very beautiful valleys with great rows of trees. The valleys are two or three leagues broad, and great quantities of algaroba trees grow in them, which flourish even at great distances from any water. Wherever there are groves of trees the land is free from sand, and very fertile and abundant. In ancient times these valleys were very populous, and still there are Indians in them, though not so many as in former days. As it never rains in these sandy deserts and valleys of Peru, they do not roof their houses as they do in the mountains, but build large houses of adobes, with pleasant terraced roofs of matting to shade them from the sun, nor do the Spaniards use any other roofing than these reed mats. To prepare their fields for sowing, they lead channels from the rivers to irrigate the valleys, and the channels are so well made, and with so much regularity, that all the land is irrigated without any waste. This system of irrigation makes the valleys very green and cheerful, and they are full of the fruit trees both of Spain and of this country. At all times they raise good harvests of maize and wheat, and of everything that they sow. Thus, although I have described Peru as being formed of three desert ridges, yet from them, by the will of God, descend these valleys and rivers, without which no man could live. This is the cause why the natives were so easily conquered, for, if they rebelled, they would all perish of cold and hunger. Except the land which they inhabit, the whole country is full of snowy mountains of enormous height, and very terrible. This kingdom, as I have already said, is seven thousand leagues long from north to south, but if we include all the country that the king's Yincas had under their dominion, its length would be one thousand two hundred leagues of road from north to south on a meridian. Its greatest breadth, from east to west, will be little less than 100 leagues, and in other places from 40 to 60, 
more or less. What I say of the length and breadth is to be understood as applied to the mountains also, which extend over the whole of this land of Peru. And this mighty chain, which is called the Andes, is forty leagues from the South Sea in some parts, in others sixty, in some more, and in others less. Being so very high, and the greatest heights being towards the South Sea, the rivers which flow from them on that side are small because their courses are short. The other chain of mountains, which also extends along the whole length of this country, prolongs its spurs into the plains, and ends close to the sea in some places, and at others eight or ten leagues from it, more or less. The climate of these plains is more hot than cold, and in some seasons more so than in others, and the plains are so low, that the sea is almost as high as the land. The season of greatest heat is when the sun has passed by and reached the Tropic of Capricorn, which is on the 11th of December, and then it turns again towards the equinoctial line. In the mountains, although there are provinces with a warm climate, yet the contrary may be said of them, that there is more cold weather than hot. So much I have said concerning these provinces, and further on I shall add what more there is to be observed concerning them. Chapter 37. Of the villages and provinces between the town of Pasto and the city of Quito. Having written what is notable concerning the pleasant town of Pasto, it will now be well to continue the journey, by relating what there is on the road to the city of Quito. I said that the town of Pasto was built in the valley of Atris, within the territory of the Quilasingas, a shameless people, and they and the Pastos are very dirty, and are held in little estimation by their neighbors. Leaving the town of Pasto, the road leads to a village of the Pastos called Funes, and farther on there is another called Isles. Three leagues more bring the traveller to Guamatan, and another three leagues on the road towards Quito bring him to the village of Ipiales. In all these villages there is little or no maize, the country being very cold, and the maize seed very delicate. But they grow plenty of potatoes and quinoa, besides other products. From Ipiales the road leads to a small district called Guaca, but before reaching it the road of the Incas is seen, which is as famous in these parts as that which Hannibal made over the Alps when he descended into Italy. Indeed, the former ought to be held in more estimation, as well on account of the great lodgings and storehouses along its whole length, as for being made in spite of many difficulties over rugged and swampy mountains, so that it is a sight marvellous to behold. There is also a river near the road, close to which the place is seen where, in former days, the king's Incas had built a fortress. Here they made war upon the Pastos, and set out to conquer them. There is a natural bridge over the river which appears artificial. In truth it is a lofty and massive rock, with a hole in it, through which the river passes in its fury, and on the top all wayfarers can pass at their pleasure. This bridge is called Rumakeka in the language of the Incas, which is as much as to say the stone bridge. Near this bridge there is a fountain of hot water, the heat of which is such, that in no wise can any man keep his hand long in it. The land is so cold that no one can endure it without great suffering. The king's Incas intended to have built another fortress near the bridge, and they placed faithful guards in order to prevent the troops from returning to Cusco or Quito, for the people held the region of the Pastos to be a worthless conquest. In all these villages there is a fruit called Mortunos, which is smaller than a slow, and black. If a man eats many of them he becomes giddy and sick, and for a whole day is in great pain. I know this, because when we went to give battle to Gonzalo Pizarro, a man named Rodrigo de las Peñas came with us, a friend of mine, and ensign to the captain Don Pedro de Cabrera. When we reached this village of Guaca, the said Rodrigo, having eaten some of these berries, suffered so much that we thought he would have died of them. From the small district of Guaca the road leads to Tusa, which is the last village of the Pastos. On the right hand are the mountains which overhang the Sea of Sweet Water, and on the left the height which rises from the South Sea. Further on a small hill is reached, where a fortress may be seen, built by the Incas in former days, which must be of no small strength for Indian warfare. Beyond this fort in the village of Tusa is the river of Mira, which is very warm, and on its banks there is plenty of fruit, such as melons, besides game, excellent rabbits, pigeons, and partridges. Here they reap large harvests of wheat, barley, and maize, for the land is very fertile. From the river there is a descent to the great and sumptuous buildings of Kerang, but, before arriving at them, the lagoon of Yawar Kocha is seen, which, in our language, is as much as to say the sea of blood. The Indians say that, before the arrival of the Spaniards, the king, Winakapak, for some offence committed by the natives of Kerang and other villages, ordered more than twenty thousand to be killed, and their bodies to be thrown into this lake. The dead men were so numerous that it looked like a sea of blood, for which reason this name was given. Further on are the buildings called Kerang, where some say that Atahualpa, the son of Winakapak, was born, for his mother was a native of this place. But this is certainly not the case, for I inquired into the matter with great care, and Atahualpa was born in Cusco. 
any other account of his birth is unworthy of credit. These buildings of Kerang are in a small square, and within there is a basin of cut stone. The palace and lodgings of the Incas are also of elegant stones of great size, and are very neatly fitted without cement, which is a thing worthy of no small attention. Formerly there was a temple of the sun, and within there were more than two hundred beautiful maidens dedicated to the service, who were obliged to preserve their chastity, and if any of them failed to do so she was very cruelly punished. Those who committed adultery, which was considered a great sacrilege, were buried alive. These maidens were carefully watched, and there were also priests who performed the sacrifices enjoined by their religion. This house of the sun was held in great estimation in the days of the Lord's Incas. It was reverenced and guarded, and was full of great vases of gold and silver, and of other riches which cannot be quickly enumerated. Even the walls were lined with plates of gold and silver. Although it is now in a ruinous state, there is enough left to show that it was once a magnificent structure. The Incas maintained a garrison of troops, with their officers, in this station, who were here both in time of peace and war to put down any rising. Speaking of these lords Incas, I will treat somewhat of their greatness and power before passing onwards in our journey. Chapter 38 in which it is stated who were the king's Incas, and how they ruled over Peru. As I shall often have to treat of the Incas, and give an account of many of their buildings, and of other notable things, it appears to me to be appropriate that I should say something concerning them in this place, that readers may know who these Incas were, and not misunderstand their importance, or fall into mistakes about them. I, however, have written a special book upon them and their deeds, which is very copious. From the accounts which the Indians of Cusco have given us, we gather that, in ancient times, there were great disorders in all the provinces of that kingdom which we now call Peru, and that the natives were so savage and stupid as to be beyond belief, for they say that these early tribes were bestial, and that many ate human flesh, others taking their mothers and daughters for their wives. Besides all this, they committed other greater sins, having much intercourse with the devil, whom they all served and held in high estimation. They had their castles and forts in the mountain fastnesses, and, on very slight provocation, they made war upon each other, killing and taking prisoners without mercy. Notwithstanding that they committed all these crimes and walked in wickedness, they are said to have been given to religion, which is the reason why, in many parts of this kingdom, great temples have been found where they prayed to, adored, and had interviews with the devil, making great sacrifices before their idols. The people of this kingdom lived in this manner, and great tyrants rose up in the provinces of Coyas, in the valleys of the Yuncas, and in other parts, who made fierce wars upon each other, and committed many robberies and murders, insomuch that they caused great calamities, and many castles were destroyed, while the devil, the enemy of human nature, rejoiced that so many souls should be lost. While all the provinces of Peru were in this state, two brothers rose up, the name of one of whom was Mancocapac. The Indians relate great marvels and very pleasant fables respecting these men, which may be read by any one who pleases, when the book written by me on the subject sees the light. This Manco Capac founded the city of Cusco, and established laws for the use of the people. He and his descendants were called Incas, a word which signifies lords or kings. They conquered and dominated over all the country, from Pasto to Chile, and their banners were carried to the south as far as the River Mall, and north to the Ancasmayo. These rivers were the boundaries of the empire of these Incas, which was so great, that from one end to the other is a distance of 1,300 leagues. The Incas built great fortresses, and in every province they had their captains and governors. They performed such great deeds, and ruled with such wisdom, that few in the world ever excelled them. They were very intelligent and learned without having letters, which had not been invented in these Indies. They introduced good customs into all the conquered provinces, and gave orders that the people should wear usages in the place of leathern sandals. They thought much of the immortality of the soul, and of other secrets of nature. They believed that there was a creator of all things, and they held the sun to be a god, to whom they built great temples, but, deceived by the devil, they worshipped among trees and on stones, like heathens. In the principal temples they kept a great quantity of very beautiful virgins, just as was done in the temple of Vesta, at Rome, and the rules concerning them were almost the same. They chose the bravest and most faithful captains they could find to command their armies. They were very astute and artful in turning enemies into friends without having resort to war, but they chastised rebels with severity and cruelty. But, as I have already said, I have a book concerning the Incas, so that what I have now written will suffice to enable those who may read it to understand who these kings were, and their great power, and I will therefore return to my road. Chapter 39. Of other villages and buildings between Kerang and the city of Quito, and of the robbery which the people of Otabalo are said to have committed on those of Kerang. In the former chapter I spoke of the great power and dominion which the Incas, kings of Cusco, held over all Peru, and it will now be well to proceed on our journey. 
From the royal station of Kerang the famous road of the Incas leads to the station of Otabalo, which is not, and never has been, very rich or important, but on each side of it there are large villages of Indians. Those on the west side are called Poritaco, Calaguaso, the Huacas, and Cayams, and near the great river Marañón are the Quijos in a country covered with vast forests. It was into this region that Gonzalo Pizarro made his way when he went in search of the cinnamon. He was accompanied by many valiant Spaniards, and they took with them great store of provisions, yet with all this they suffered terrible hardships and much hunger. In the fourth part of my work I will give a full account of this discovery, and I will relate how they came, by this way, to the great river, and how Captain Oriana came down it into the ocean, went to Spain, and was named governor of these countries by His Majesty. Towards the east are the farms of Kotokoyam and the forests of Yumbo, besides many other districts, some of which have not been thoroughly explored. The natives of Otabalo and Kerang are called Guamaraconas, Wainakuna. The name arose from what was said after the massacre ordered by Hwanakapak in the lake, where most of the men were killed. Only boys were left in these villages, and the word means in our language now you are boys. The natives of Kerang are very hostile to those of Otabalo for the following reason. When the news of the arrival of the Spaniards was spread abroad in the provinces of Quito, together with the imprisonment of Atahualpa, the people were filled with wonder and fear, and were particularly astonished at what they heard concerning the swiftness of the horses. Thus they awaited their arrival, thinking, that as they had overthrown the Inca their lord, they also would be subjugated. At this time the lord of Kayam had a great quantity of treasure in his charge, and he of Otabalo observed that his neighbor was in great fear and perturbation for the safety of the precious treasure. The chief of Otabalo then called together his people, and, selecting those who were most agile and cunning, ordered them to dress in shirts and long mantles, and, with wands in their hands, to mount their best sheep and to climb up into the heights, so that they could be seen by those of Kerang. He, with most of his people and some women, in the meantime, fled to Kerang with great demonstrations of fear, saying that he was flying from the fury of the Spaniards, who had reached his villages on their horses, and that he had left all his valuables behind, to escape from their cruelty. This news caused great terror, and it was received as certain, because the Indians, mounted on sheep, could be seen on the hills, so the people of Kerang began their flight. Otabalo pretended to do the same, but he and his people returned to Kerang, and stole all the treasure they could find, which was not little. When those of Kerang returned, at the end of a few days, the deceit was discovered. This strange robbery caused much agitation among the people of Kerang, and they had several debates among themselves, but, as the captain Sebastian de Balalcazar, with the Spaniards, entered the provinces of Quito a few days after this occurrence, they dropped their quarrels in order to defend themselves. Thus the people of Otabalo retained what they had robbed, as is stated by many Indians of these parts, and the feud has not ceased amongst them. From the station of Otabalo the road leads to that of Kacheski, and crosses a snowy pass, where it is so cold that there is some trouble in preserving life. From Kacheski the road passes on to Gualabamba, which is four leagues from Quito, and here, the land being low and nearly on the equator, it is warm, but not so much so as to prevent it from being very populous, and it yields all things necessary for the support of man. We who have travelled in these parts know what there is on this equinoctial line, which some ancient authors held to be an uninhabitable region. Under the line there is winter and summer, and the country is thickly inhabited, the crops which are sown yielding abundantly, especially wheat and barley. The road which unites these stations is crossed by several rivers, all with bridges, now much out of repair, and there are grand buildings and many other things to be seen. The distance from Gualabamba to Quito is four leagues, and there are several houses and farms along the roadside, where the Spaniards have their flocks until the plains of Anaquito is reached. Here, in 1545, during the month of January, the Viceroy Blasco Núñez Vela arrived with a company of Spaniards, who followed him, in opposition to those who upheld the tyranny. Gonzalo Pizarro, who had seized the government of the country, and called himself governor under false colors, accompanied by most of the conquerors of Peru, marched out of the city of Quito and gave battle to the viceroy. The unfortunate viceroy, and many brave knights who were showing their loyalty and desire to serve his majesty, were left dead on the field. Passing this plain of Anaquito, the city of Quito is presently reached. Chapter 40. Of the situation of the city of San Francisco del Quito, of its foundation, and who it was who founded it. The city of San Francisco del Quito is in the northern province of the Kingdom of Peru. This province is nearly 60 leagues long from east to west, and 25 or 30 broad. The city is built amongst ancient buildings, which the Incas, in the days of their power, had ordered to be raised in these parts. They were the work of the illustrious and powerful Huaynacapac, and of the great Tupac, his father, and the natives called these royal and noble buildings Quito, whence the city took its name. The climate is healthy, 
and more cold than warm. There is little or no extent of view from the city, because it is situated in a hollow surrounded by high mountains, and the level space is so confined that there will be some difficulty in building if it is desired to enlarge the city, but it could be made very strong if it was considered necessary. To the west are the cities of Puerto Viejo, and Guayaquil, which are about 70 and 80 leagues distant, and to the south are the cities of Loxa and San Miguel, the one 130 and the other 80 leagues distant. To the east are the forests and the sources of the river which is called the Freshwater Sea, and to the north is the government of Papayan, which we have just passed. The city of Quito is under the equinoctial line, indeed only seven leagues distant from it. The surrounding country appears to be sterile, but in reality it is very fertile, and all kinds of cattle are bred in it plentifully, besides other provisions, corn and pulse, fruit and birds. The country is very pleasant, and particularly resembles Spain in its pastures and its climate, for the summer begins in April, and lasts until November, and, though it is cold, the land is no more injured by it than in Spain. In the plains they reap a great quantity of wheat and barley, so that there is a plentiful supply of provisions in the province, and in time it will yield all the fruits of our Spain, for even now they begin to grow some of them. The natives are in general more gentle and better disposed, and have fewer vices than any of those we have passed, and indeed than all the Indians of the greater part of Peru. This, at least, is what I myself have seen and understood, although others have formed a different opinion. But if they had seen and noted all these people as I have done, I hold it for certain that they would be of my way of thinking. They are a people of middle height, and very hard workers. They live in the same way as the people of the King's Yincas, except that they are not so clever, seeing that they were conquered by them, and now live by the rules which were ordered to be observed by the Yincas. For in ancient times they were, like their neighbors, badly dressed and without industry in the erection of buildings. There are many warm valleys where fruit trees and pulses are cultivated all the year round. There are also vineyards in these valleys, but as the cultivation has only lately commenced, I can only mention the hope that they will yield, but they already have large orange and lime trees. The pulses of Spain yield abundantly, and all other provisions may be had that man requires. There is also a kind of spice, which we call cinnamon, brought from the forest to the eastward. It is a fruit, or kind of flower, which grows on the very large cinnamon trees, and there is nothing in Spain that can be compared with it, unless it be an acorn, but it is of a reddish color inclined to black, and much larger and rounder. The taste is very pleasant, like that of real cinnamon, and it is only eaten after it has been pounded, for, if it is stewed like real cinnamon, it loses the strength of its flavor. It makes a warm cordial, as I can affirm from experience, for the natives trade with it, and use it in their illnesses, particularly for pains in the bowels and stomach. They take it as a drink. They have great store of cotton, which they make into cloth for their dresses, and also use it for paying tribute. In the neighborhood of the city of Quito there are many flocks of what we call sheep, but they are more like camels. Further on I shall treat of these animals, of their shape, and of the different sorts of these sheep of Peru, as we call them. There are also many deer, rabbits, partridges, pigeons, doves, and other game. Of provisions, besides maize, there are two other products which form the principal food of these Indians. One is called potato, and is a kind of earth nut, which, after it has been boiled, is as tender as a cooked chestnut, but it has no more skin than a truffle, and it grows under the earth in the same way. This root produces a plant exactly like a poppy. The other food is very good, and is called quinoa. The leaf is like a Moorish rush, amaranth, and the plant grows almost to the height of a man, forming a very small seed, sometimes white and at others reddish. Of these seeds they make a drink, and also eat them cooked, as we do rice. There are many other seeds and roots, but the natives of Quito, seeing the value of wheat and barley, sow one or the other, and eat them, also making a drink from the barley. As I have said before, all these Indians are industrious, although, in some of the provinces, they have a different character, as I will relate when we pass through them, for the women are made to work in the fields, while their husbands sow and weave, and occupy themselves with female work. I have seen, in the villages near Cusco, while the women are ploughing, the men spinning and preparing their arms and clothes, work suited to women and not to men. In the time of the Incas there was a royal road made by the force and labor of men, which began at this city of Quito, and went as far as Cusco, whence another of equal grandeur and magnitude led to the province of Chile, which is more than 1,200 leagues from Quito. On these roads there were pleasant and beautiful lodgings and palaces every three or four leagues, very richly adorned. These roads may be compared to that which the Romans made in Spain, and which we call the Silver Road. I have stopped longer to describe the noteworthy things of Quito than at any of the other cities we have left behind, and the reason is that this city is the principal place in this part of Peru, and has always been much esteemed. To conclude with it, 
I must add that it was founded and settled by Captain Sebastian Balalcazar, who was afterwards governor and adelantado of the province of Papayan, in the name of the Emperor, Don Carlos our Lord, the adelantado Don Francisco Pizarro being governor and captain general of the kingdoms of Peru and provinces of New Castile, in the year of the Nativity of our Redeemer Jesus Christ 1534.